So let's get our conversation started. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Mike Sandwith and Stephen Smith, but I'm first going to introduce Stephen Smith. As many of you know, Stephen is the Deputy Commissioner and Director of TenCare, Tennessee's Medicaid program. He's a veteran of both TenCare and public service generally, so we are um, especially excited for him to bring his expertise to our discussion today. In his current role, Mr. Smith manages um, 15 billion healthcare enterprise that provides services to 1.7 million Tennesseans. In 2020, he led the successful negotiations with the federal government that uh, resulted in Tennessee's first of its kind 10 care waiver, bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars for the 10 care program. Uh, prior to being appointed to this role, he served as chief of staff to Governor Bill Haslam where he led the governor's initiative to enact the IMPROVE Act, which resulted in crucial infrastructure investment and stability, as well as the largest tax cut in um, the state's history. He's previously served as deputy commissioner for policy and external affairs at the Department of Education and in private law practice. He grew up in rural West Tennessee and currently lives in Nashville with his family. So join me in welcoming Stephen Smith. Thank you very much. It is uh, great to be with you all. I appreciate the invitation uh, to be here. Uh, I don't think I have to tell anyone in this room that there are so many positive things that are happening in this state. Incredible economic development, low tax burden for our businesses and our citizens, outstanding tourism, uh, record investment in infrastructure, as you saw when you're trying to get to this place and park. Um, record investments in public education, and, and record investments in healthcare as well. All of these things have led to uh, Tennessee really being a destination for so many. And I really can think of no better place to have a SATA reform conference than here in Nashville. Nashville's healthcare industry generates nearly $100 billion in revenue nationwide, 500,000 jobs across the country. That's why we call Nashville the the healthcare capital, and I really think that that translates throughout the state. Today, of course, I am here to talk about the state of our Medicaid program, known as uh, TenCare, and how uh, we fit into this healthcare ecosystem. When you sit where I sit, you find that Medicaid is really the place that so much of this vast healthcare community comes together. Payers, providers, private equity, entrepreneurs, government, policymakers, advocacy groups, and yes, let's not forget patients and 10 care members. And as you all know, there are many differing opinions about what Medicaid should be. There's a lot of debate about how we should get there. Uh, and that's just simple math. 10 care covers about a fourth of the state's population. We cover half of all the births in this state, and we cover half of all the children in this state. That means that we generate a lot of interest, and it also means that we can have a major impact on the direction of the industry. Our mission at TenCare is simple in words, but it is very complex in action. And that mission is to improve lives through high quality, cost-effective care. And while, of course, our mission is on improving the lives of the people that we serve in the 10 care program, we really view our role as one where we can have an impact uh, for, on Tennesseans through all walks of life, not just the Medicaid population. Now, sometimes people hear that and they think it's a bit of a stretch, but when you consider the size of the 10 care budget, um, as you heard, we're at, we're at 15, over $15 billion now. And so you think about that and the impact that that has on the overall state budget, and therefore all of the other policy goals of state government and all the things that we all care about as citizens, I think that our responsibilities become more clear. TenCare does impact our state's ability to deliver quality public education for our, our kids. It does impact the state's ability to make improvements in criminal justice and public safety and infrastructure and economic development. And 10 care does impact our state's ability to keep taxes and debt low in a state where 
Our citizens expect it and they demand it. We have to be successful in our efforts at TenCare or we lose ground as a state. And part of my job as the TenCare director, I believe, is to do our part so that people never need Medicaid in the first place. And that's a, that's a recognition and a responsibility that we take very seriously. And while we face criticism at times for that cost-effective piece of our mission, it's actually this very piece that allows us to improve quality and access and provider support and health outcomes within TenCare and, and to do so without breaking the state budget. I'm really proud to be able to say that TenCare is in a stronger position today than at any point in our history. And that's whether you measure that based on that cost-effective piece of our mission or on the quality side of our mission. And that's not because of me or any one person, but rather a, a group of people, multiple governors from both parties, general assemblies, leaders, partners, providers, many of you, in fact, uh, working over the last two decades to improve and to be better. A strong and stable Medicaid program is good for everyone in this room because it allows us to think bigger and it just opens up so many more possibilities for our state. But in order to tell the story of TenCare, in order to talk about the present and the future, I had to start with the past because that past plays such a large role in the policy decisions that we make today. It's a past that is filled with challenges, mistakes, lessons, lessons that we have learned from and lessons that we should and that we still do uh, build from. We've come a long way in our 10 care program. Uh, it really wasn't that long ago when double digit growth trends and runaway costs threatened the very existence of 10 care, at least as we know it. In fact, in the early 2000s, projections showed that the 10 care budget was, was literally going to take every available new state revenue dollar in just a few short years. And of course, that was unsustainable. And so the executive branch and the legislative branch at the time took major steps, made major reforms uh, to, to stabilize the program. And some of those steps were, were very painful and very challenging, and no one wants to be in that position again. But that history is really important because, uh, as, as I said, it, it still plays such a large role in the decisions that we have to make today. And I bring that up because sometimes people will say to me, well, if, if TenCare really believed in its mission, then you would cover more people and you would cover more services and you would pay more for those services. But of course, the reality is it's not, it's not that simple. Nothing is, is ever that simple. TenCare accounts for more than a fourth of the state budget. Uh, it used to be a third, so we're, we're doing better there, but it's about a fourth. It's more than a fourth. So what that means then is that if we are unable to control costs to a reasonable level, there won't be any funds left over for other state priorities. And there certainly won't be any funds left over for the types of 10 care improvements that we've seen over the last couple of years, which are record improvements, uh, really unprecedented. So while it may seem counterintuitive, controlling cost growth, that cost-effective piece of our mission, means that we can do more to further the priorities of state government, both inside and outside of health and health care. I think it's important for those of us that are involved in government and specifically Medicaid to translate these statements and these, these numbers and these facts that I'm, that I'm talking about to translate in, that into, into real uh, people. And I'll, I'll give you a very tangible illustration. If we had stayed on that trajectory uh, of the early, uh, late 90s and early 2000s and not made those reforms that uh, I talked about, we would have spent an additional $70 billion in cumulative state funding from that point to today. And today our recurring budget in state dollars only would be $6 billion more than it is today. That's a staggering number. I didn't believe it when I first uh, saw it and I had our team go back and rerun the numbers and it's, it's actually true. And even if we had made all those reforms, but our spending growth rate had simply been at the national Medicaid program average, since 2012, we would have spent an additional $5 billion in cumulative funding 
And today our budget would be $1 billion more than it is today on a recurring basis. Now, it just so happens that last year, our state made a record investment in, in K through 12 public education of $1 billion. Uh, as you heard in the introduction, I used to work in education policy for the state. And uh, if you would have told me that we would reach a point in Tennessee where we could make a $1 billion recurring investment in K through 12 education, I would have said that you're crazy. Uh, but it happened. And that's something that is, uh, you talk about improving lives, that's something that is going to be such a positive, have such a positive impact on our children and their families. But the point is that investment is simply not possible without the work and the choices that we have made in the 10 care program. But perhaps more relevant to this discussion is that the reality is we, we would not and we could not accept spending billions of additional recurring state funding on Medicaid at the expense of all the other things that we have to do in state government. Meaning one of two things would have to happen. One, higher taxes for our citizens to fund all of the people and the services that we currently provide through 10 care. Or two, cuts to the 10 care roles or the services that we provide or cuts to provider rates. We want to avoid those cuts at all costs. Uh, that's why major reforms had to be made in the early 2000s and beyond, and that's why we work so hard to control cost growth today. We can be proud as a state that we have avoided those reductions, and we've done it through sound fiscal management, that cost-effective care piece. But it's really important for me to stress to you all that we have not done that on the backs of quality or access. In fact, it's, it's just the opposite. We've increased access and we've made great strides on quality. By any measure, we've seen marked improvement in quality and health outcomes within the 10 care program and population. Many of you are familiar with the HEDIS measures. HEDIS stands for the Healthcare Effectiveness Data and Information Set. Uh, it's one of the most used and validated healthcare measurements that tracks healthcare quality and outcomes. There are about 150 of these measures, and 10 CARES outcomes today are better than the national average in nearly 60% of those categories. Now, I'm not suggesting that we deserve a, a party for uh, a 60% number, but compare that to 2010 when we exceeded the national average in only 40% of those categories. That's considerable improvement over the last decade. So how have we done it? This is a conference about reform, and so we should take note of the reforms that have been made uh, and that have been successful. We should learn from those. We should build from those. Some people will say that, well, you, you did that by cutting about 200,000 people from the 10 care rolls back in 2004, those tough reforms that I talked about earlier. Uh, that's the easy answer, but it's not, it's not the accurate answer. That did happen, but if you look at the decade prior to the reforms, you will find that our enrollment increased by 22%. Over that same time, our cost increased by 224%. So what that tells us and what that confirms to us is that there were much more important reforms that were made to stabilize the program. I believe that those reforms really begin with effective managed care. Moving from numerous, volatile, inexperienced, and fragmented health plans to a much smaller number of stable, experienced health plans with statewide operations that have the sophistication to serve people at the right time, in the right setting, and at the right cost. Another notable reform uh, that we have made is to, to try to move away from only volume-based payments to providers to value-based payment arrangements. We support that concept, not only from a provider payment perspective, but also from a federal and state partnership perspective. And then lastly, we have had a major focus on home and community-based services and allowing people to live as independently as possible versus only having the option of uh, being in an institution. That is a win-win. It's a win for the individual that's being served because the overwhelming majority of people want to live in their homes, they want to live in their communities, they want to live as independently as possible. 
And it's a win for the state and taxpayers because we can do that at such a, a, a lower cost, which means we can take those savings and we can serve more people. And that's exactly what we've done. This concept of savings and reinvestment is exactly what our latest innovation in TenCare, known as TenCare 3, is all about. It actually takes that concept and it puts it into hyperdrive by rewarding Tennessee for its effective management of its Medicaid program and, and that it reward comes in the form of what are called shared savings. That means that those savings stay here in Tennessee rather than reverting to Washington and then we take those savings and we reinvest them back into the TenCare program. When we talk about what is to come for TenCare and what is possible, TenCare 3 is at the forefront because it represents our current and present success, but it also will be the catalyst for our future. When we propose TenCare 3, and some of you may have heard it referred to as a block grant, uh, it's really not a block grant, at least in the traditional sense. Uh, the names and the labels really don't matter, but when we propose this, we committed to do more, not less, and we have made good on that commitment. Since the inception of this waiver, we've had the largest TenCare investments that anyone can remember. Highlighted first by the addition of a comprehensive adult dental program for the first time in Tennessee's history. That's 600,000 adults whose lives will be positively impacted and improved through dental care. In addition, we've had the goal since the beginning of Governor Lee's administration of eliminating the waiting list for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities that are wanting to be a part of our ECF Choices program. We received uh, significant funding to attack that goal, and now we are serving 2,300 additional people. We actually eliminated the waiting list uh, for a period of time. That's an incredible accomplishment, but it's one that's made possible only by working to control costs and improve quality. These record investments extend to our provider community. Since 2021, through TenCare, our state has been able to make more than $2 billion in provider investments. That's in addition to the negotiated rate increases through our managed care organizations. We know that our providers have experienced great challenges, particularly around the recruitment and retention of the workforce. And um, I'm very proud that we've stepped up in a big way with large increases to hospitals and nursing homes, behavioral health, home and community-based services, dental, and, and much more. We were able to make these investments because of our confidence to be successful under the provisions of our waiver uh, and we now have confirmation that not only is 10 Care 3 working, it is a resounding success. Earlier this year in his State of the State address, Governor Lee announced a first year shared savings allotment of more than $300 million that we, with the approval of the General Assembly, are doing exactly what we said we were going to do, enhance benefits, and yes, serve more people in need. And, and here's the kicker. We were able to do all of this at no additional Tennessee taxpayer expense. Through the Governor's Strong Families Initiative and these shared savings, we're able to uh, have a permanent extension of our postpartum coverage uh, for new mothers. We're able to increase the eligibility for pregnant women. We are able to ensure 12 months of continuous coverage for children. And we also are increasing the eligibility for parents closing that coverage gap between Medicaid eligibility and the federal marketplace subsidies. All told, these provisions will add 25,000 additional people to the TenCare program. In addition, we are seeking to cover diapers for babies up to two years of age, which if approved will make Tennessee the first Medicaid program in the country to offer that benefit. All of these investments are made possible by the 10 Care 3 waiver and the resulting shared savings, and they confirm the, the collective sound decision making of our state regarding our 10 Care program over the course of these last two decades. At the end of the day, it's about improving health, which drives down health care costs, which results in shared savings, which results in a reinvestment of, of those savings back into the program, which results in improved health. So it's a cycle. And the whole idea is the cycle just starts all over again. 
And that's the beauty of what is, it, what is possible in the future. While these investments are exciting and they are unprecedented, we will have the opportunity to do so much more in the future. Let me uh, close with uh, some words of caution, but uh, hopefully also some words of optimism. As a country, we, we spend too much on healthcare. I think everyone in this room recognizes that. It's a viewpoint that is almost universally accepted. And, and maybe if we got better results than our comparable countries, we would be okay with that. But uh, we all know that that is not the case. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that one Medicaid program in the Southeast can solve the nationwide spending problem. Uh, but we should at least try to do our part and maybe, just maybe, serve as a model for the rest of the country. That is what we are trying to do. I think we are making progress. It's not a sprint. Uh, it took a lot of hard work from a lot of people to get to this point. It's going to take a lot of work from a lot of people to continue the progress. It doesn't, it doesn't just happen. But we can't move away from the things that got us here, coupling those two pieces of our mission, cost effectiveness and quality of care. We can't move away from those things and expect to remain successful. Go back to that past that I talked about earlier. We didn't reach this point of today's success overnight. It took years of commitment, focus, hard decisions, and good judgment. Likewise, it, failure will not happen overnight. It will be days and weeks and years of moving away from those core principles. And then one day we wake up and the 10 care budget is taking every available new state revenue dollar and we all wonder what happened. We can avoid that here in Tennessee because all of the tools are in place. I'm confident that together we will make the right decisions and that years of continued success and prosperity are ahead. Now, I recognize that my opinion uh, and perspective is one of many. Um, and I recognize that there are real challenges and struggles within the stakeholder groups that you all represent. We're going to have to combine a lot of good ideas and perspectives to get this right. And uh, I just feel very fortunate to be in the room and to be part of the discussion. So again, thank you all for the, for the invitation. I think now we're gonna do some uh, Q&A and uh, look forward to your, to your questions. Okay, I'm going to prime the pump. What are you most proud of with everything you've done with Pen Care? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, let me, I'll give you a couple of, uh, of member stories uh, that I think really illustrate how we can meet our mission and, and really improve lives. Um, I talked about the dental investment for adults. Um, and and that, that was a really big deal. And um, we are starting, you know, we started that in January of this year. And so we've now have had thousands of 10 care members that are able to get dental care that haven't been able to get it. And um, we, get, uh, we get communication from those members. And the other day we got one uh, from um, a young mother named Melissa and she is studying to be a physician's assistant. And she was talking about um, how happy she was that for the first time she's gonna be able to get, or she's been able to get dental care and that she's been so ashamed of her appearance and so ashamed to smile. And um, she want, she's studying to be a physician's assistant and she was so concerned that she said, how can I serve my uh, patients if they look at me and I'm not projecting good health. Um, and so it's opened up um, doors for her. And it, uh, I didn't realize how much uh, dental care could impact one's mental health. And um, so it's, it's much more than just the, the health care service, but when someone feels confident to be able to smile and to be able to communicate, that impacts their ability to uh, get employment and 
it impacts everything about their lives. And so um, I'm really proud of that. I think that's, that's going to have a huge impact. And then um, another story that really sticks with me relates to our home and community-based service programs. I mentioned about how we're able to serve people in their homes versus an institution. And um, I had the opportunity to meet a young man who, uh, he's, he's 24 years old today, but um, when he was 20 years old, he was in college, and he was very healthy, uh, very athletic, and he was playing volleyball one day with his friends, and he just turned his head a certain way, and, uh, and he, he became paralyzed. And the doctors really can't explain what happened. It's, it's like one of two cases like this that's ever happened in the nation. Um, but he was paralyzed from the neck down on a ventilator. And um, through our programs, our 10 care programs, he is able to uh, live in his home. Uh, he has all the assisted technology that he needs. He has caregivers that come in at certain times of the day. But he's able to, uh, he enrolled uh, in an online uh, program through Arizona, Arizona State University. Uh, and I heard from his mother uh, a couple weeks ago that he is getting his degree uh, this, uh, this December. And um, I remember when I went to visit him, he was telling me that he already has uh, job offers. Uh, and it, it was interesting because one of the, he said one of the blessings of the pandemic is that employers now are more willing to hire people uh, that don't live uh, in the particular location, and so you don't have to come into the office, you can work from home, which that's what he needs to do. Uh, but I think about what if we didn't have this program? His only option would be to live in an institution, and he would not be able to pursue his dreams. Uh, and so um, that's a case that has always, it really sticks with me, and uh, it helps me to understand uh, how much of a an impact that we can have as a state and as a Medicaid program. That's great. Um, does anyone have a question for Stephen out in the <clears throat> audience? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. 20, you mentioned 25,000 people that would be affected by the uh, reforms that Governor Lee instituted in this most recent budget. Um, but it's my understanding those have not started yet, and I'm wondering when they will. That's right. Some of those have started, but um, a portion have not because we have to sub we're waiting on the federal government to give us approval. So we have submitted the, the required uh, waiver amendments. Uh, and the SPA amendments, the state plan amendments to the federal government to get those approved. And uh, we're, so we're on, we're on, it's a, Medicaid's a federal state partnership. Um, and so uh, we're dependent on federal government action. Those things will happen. Um, the, the one thing that I guess there is, that will probably take the longest is the diaper uh, program. Because like I said, we will be the first pro state in the nation to be able to do that if we get a, if we get approval, but because no state has ever done this, I think that piece will take longer. But it's all sitting with the federal government today, and we're waiting we're waiting on them. But we're hopeful that most of that will be January. Uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed, uh, but it's uh, those things those things will happen. Hi, um, Stephen, I really appreciated uh, when you were talking about your mission of both improving care and controlling costs, and then also the mission of how do we improve other things in Tennessee that make it so that there are less people who actually need to enroll in Medicaid to begin with. Um, and so my question to you is, in that light, you also mentioned education and lots of other factors. From your perspective and from your data, what are the key drivers um, that are um, causing individuals to need to enroll in Medicaid, and what are the pieces that um, we can do both in healthcare and outside of healthcare to support people in their time of need to potentially even not need Medicaid to begin with? Yeah. Um, 
would love your opinions. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. It's a big question. I think everybody's trying to figure that out. Um, everybody in government at the federal level and at the state level. Um, personal opinion, I think I think education is is the key and educational opportunity, equal educational opportunity for all students. There's a lot of debate about, uh, there's a lot of debate in, in Medicaid and healthcare policy. Maybe there's even more debate about education policy. Um, but I think everyone agrees that we should have equal opportunity for every child to have a high quality education um, but there's a lot of debate about what that should look like. But I would, um, I would say education and, of course, jobs, so that when we have an educated population that there are um, high-quality jobs uh, available to them where they can, they can earn uh, a living where, uh, and not just, not just a living where they're, living paycheck to paycheck, but where they can have a high, everyone can have a high quality of life. Hey, Stephen. Uh, Brooks David with McKenzie over here. Uh, it's hard to see you, but yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I know Brooks. Off to the right, there I know that go. voice. Um, I, you know, I think one of the themes of uh, your speech was uh, just how many ways ten care now um, is is doing so much that you know if you look back far enough you can see uh, where ten care wasn't able to do some of these things. I think another one um, I'd love to hear you just talk about the experience is you know every state is going through eligibility unwinding right after the Affordable Care Act. Uh, sorry, after the uh, uh, pandemic, and you know I think that different states have had different experiences there. Um, but TenCare once did not have the systems that they have now, and that means that you know people are getting their correct uh, decisions, but they're also, I think, in Tennessee, having a better customer experience as well. So you know, if you could talk about kind of the the uh, the evolution there as well. Yeah, that's such a great point. And what Brooks is referring to is we now have a modern eligibility system. And um, I cannot imagine what we would be dealing with today going through this process if we did not have that system up and running. Uh, I, I have colleagues in other states where they don't have uh, the, the modernized eligibility system and um, the difficulties that they are experiencing are tremendous. But it just makes such a, we, we, were, we were very well prepared as a state uh, to begin the renewal process. And I think most of you probably know this already, but for the last three years, uh, because of the pandemic, we've been on pause, which means that we have not uh, had to go through the, the required annual redetermination process for eligibility for 10 care members. So um, we haven't done this for three years. We've had members that haven't done this for three years. So it is a, it's a big challenge. Uh, what I can say is, from a process standpoint, things are, are going well here in Tennessee. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't have challenges. The biggest challenge, and you'll see this across the country, is that um, some people do not respond. Um, and by law, if people do not respond, we have, we have no choice. We, we have to remove them from the 10 care rolls because you, you have to be able to prove eligibility. But I can give you some numbers. Uh, in terms of the percentage of people that have been renewed in Tennessee, we are at about 60%. Uh, that is higher than the national average. Uh, in terms of people that have been automatically renewed, which means they, have, they didn't have to do anything, we we're able to use other uh, sources of information to verify their eligibility. We are at 40%, which is also higher than the national average. So I'm very proud of our team. I'm very proud of um, our preparation and our communication efforts. It's not a, this is not a perfect uh, system. Uh, that doesn't exist 
Um, but um, I think we are we're doing we're doing really well. Hi, Stephen. JC Worrell, Rural Health Association of Tennessee. Good to see you. I uh, recently surveyed our membership, rural health care providers, school health, mental behavioral health, the gamut of people that care about health in rural areas. And the number one topic at front of mind was people without insurance, but not just that, also the affordability of insurance for small employers. And they kind of bucketed it in the same. So I really like and appreciate the comments around education and jobs at the same time, if those jobs are not offering insurance plans or private plans, we're, we're still gonna kind of be caught in a hard situation for people that need care, right? They need access to care, they need insurance for affordability. So I'm just curious what lessons from 10 care can be learned for uh, private insurance companies and what are those conversations that are happening that can maybe help bring some of those quality and affordability pieces. Uh, so maybe insurers, uh, or excuse me, employers can um, offer those benefits that are increasingly being reduced. Yeah, that's, a, that's another big question. Um, of, course, of course, our focus and my focus is on the, the government insurance program um, but you're right. I mean, uh, what I was talking about earlier is just the, the cost of healthcare is unsustainable. And if you are a small business, um, it's really hard to be able to afford um, insurance to, to offer to your employees. Um, and so I think we have a collective responsibility to do our part to try to bend the cost curve, uh, to lower healthcare costs. And I think government can play a big role in that because we do, uh, because of the, the size of our population and the, the number of people that we cover, we can have a large impact on, uh, on commercial payers as well. Uh, but. I don't have any brilliant uh, words of wisdom as to how to um, address the, the commercial side or the private payer side, but I do think it's we all have to recognize that uh, we, we can't keep going down this path. And everybody recognizes it, but um, it's really hard to do something about it because, um, well, let's just be honest, there's politics at play here. And, um, if you're if you're talking about cutting benefits or um, reducing what we're gonna what we're going to pay, it's just really hard to do that. And there are good arguments on on all sides. Uh, but I agree with you that uh, we need to look at it collectively. Well, thank you, Stephen. Yeah, thank you. You have a good conference. <clears throat>